afternoon and or evening, depending on which continent you're on. Today is Tuesday, the 24th of March, 2020. I'm Brock Jennings. And I'm Peter Clark. And this is Stumbling Block. And we are joined today by Professor Ann Carpenter from out in the San Francisco area. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello. So I'm Ann Carpenter. I'm an associate professor at St. Mary's College of California, which is indeed in the San Francisco area. And uh, my areas of expertise include theological aesthetics, Hansers von Balthasar, uh, metaphysics, monasticism, and I teach a lot of our core systematic theology classes here at St. Mary's. Oh man, I'm outnumbered by systematicians. <laughs> Vindication finally comes my way, Peter. So, Anne is notable. So, um, just the other day we had our first guest who wasn't connected to Luther Seminary, and now we have our first guest who is not even a Lutheran. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> and being a Catholic theologian, so. Yes. Yes, I was going to ask you, Anne, given your uh, specialties, if you were Roman Catholic. I am indeed. So you teach Hans Urs von Balthasar. I do. Um, my doctor father is Jürgen Maltmann. Really? Yes. And these are these are not friends. I don't think. <laughs> well, they were. They were, as far as I know, friendly colleagues with each other. Sure, sure. I, I don't think they disliked each other. Dr. Maltman led me to von Balthasar's work in my own dissertation. Wow. Because I'm writing on uh, Trinitarian theology of the cross from the standpoint of Holy Saturday. Oh, okay, yeah. That would be and, Balthazar. And mm -hmm. so he said, Van Balthazar has a meditation on Holy Saturday, meaning Theologie der Drei Tage, which, of course, I started reading in English as Mysterium Pascala first. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I love it. I haven't finished the book, but I love it so far. Yeah, it's a very profound meditation. But my question for you is... Uh, I didn't understand. Von Balthasar accuses Dr. Maltman of Hegelianizing theology. Yes. And when I asked Dr. Maltman about that a few months ago, he just chuckled at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I wonder, just as a personal question... Uh, uh, sorry, listeners, for uh, making our uh, nice guest, who's an esteemed scholar here, uh, answer one of my hobby horses. But is what's von Balthasar doing when he's saying that Maltman is Hegelianizing theology? Is he trying to un-Hegelianize theology? But it's uh, he's talking about how Dr. Maltman Hegelianized theology with... Um, Gosh, I'm having trouble finding the page. It's the first page. With Theology of Hope, Crucified God, and Trinity in the Kingdom. And it seemed to me as if Van Balthazar was trying to, like Karl Barth, base his theology on no philosophical influences. Is that correct? Balthazar? Yes, oh. or, or at least not the German idealism tradition. Oh, he's very familiar with it, though, uh, and it borrows from them, in fact. Um, okay, then what's his problem with Dr. Maltman using Hegel? Well, so it's not the fact of using Hegel. It's what one does with Hegel. Balthazar uh. has... <laughs> yeah, Balthazar has certain hesitations <clears throat> about following any philosopher over certain points that seem to disagree with the, the broader Christian tradition. So mm -hmm. for, so for Balthazar, what Hegel does 
that really cannot be done with respect to God. Hegel makes God change and consumes God with history. Mm. Uh, so that God is kind of actualized through history. Mm -hmm. That's at least Balthazar's take. And for Balthazar, that that makes a kind of nonsense out of the Gospels and out um, sort of vitiates traditional Christianity sort of too much. It's not really whether you're Hegelian, it's whether you follow Hegel on, on this point, for example. And he thinks that Maltman follows Hegel on that point? Because I would say Maltman doesn't follow Hegel on that point. Well, at least in Theodrama 5, um, Balthazar has an extended discussion of uh, Maltman, and he seems to think that Maltman doesn't get himself out of Hegelianism mm. and into the gospel uh, and the undying God. Um, now, he, he may or may not be right on that, but that's his... That's his take, and he'll generally associate philosophies that are idealists with Hegel, which is which is not incorrect. That's Hegel's mm -hmm. sort of the ma the main idealist there. And and so, what was your gee, Peter? I just said we weren't going to make this into an episode on von Balthasar, but we've got a Balthasar scholar here. I just got to ask. No, this. go for it. Um. Uh, what was your dissertation on related to von Balthasar? My dissertation was two things. Um, it was, on the one hand, a study of the early Balthasar and his dissertation and all that. But it was more broadly a study of the way Balthasar uses both literary and philosophical methods to speculate theologically. And so I just try to describe how he does that, how those are different modalities for him, and why it's such an important uh, thing to understand about the way he's arguing, or else you'll misunderstand his argument. So what are, what are then the philosophers that he goes with over and against Hegel? Um, and so it'll be a collection of, of artists and philosophers. Mm -hmm. He's greatly influenced by Maurice Blundell, Eric Shavara. Um, he's influenced by Ferdinand Ulrich. Those are some also Catholic philosophers who are generally phenomenological in key. And uh, alongside that, he'll have artists like Charles Peggy. Um, he's incredibly influenced by Rilke, even though he doesn't follow Rilke and everything. Goethe is really mm. important, Balthazar. Things like that. He's got a wide range of influences, so it's hard to nail him down on one. And he also studied music, didn't he? Yeah, he was a concert-level pianist. Um, wow. wow. Yeah. He, and he had perfect pitch. He was very, very musically talented. Uh, didn't end up going into it. He got, he got his degree in Germanistics, which is a kind of Literary and philosophical degree. Um, and he, uh, talk about his, if you would, his friendship and deep collegiality with Karl Barth. Yeah, there's a really good book on that written by my mentor, Steve Long, called Saving Karl Barth. Um, Saving Karl Barth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From what does Karl Barth need to be saved? <laughs> oh, it's a remarkable little book, um, actually. Well, it's not that little. Uh, that traces their friendship and shows how hard Balthazar worked to make Karl Barth understandable to a Catholic audience, hmm. which was Balthazar 
are its sort of main goal, because you won't often find Catholic readers of Karl Barth. Are and you a Catholic reader of Karl Barth? I am not. No, I'm a very typical Catholic, and as much as I haven't read much Karl Barth, um, I've read Balthazar's book on Karl Barth. How is that, is a, by the way? I need to get that oh, it's book. A, it's a beautiful book. Um, written before they were close friends. He had to revise it to get it published because the censors didn't like the first version for some reason. Hmm. Did you read um, it in German or English? In English. Okay. Okay. I just, I wasn't sure if you, uh, if you had to, my, my, my dream is to read the entirety of the church dogmatics of Karl Barth in German. Oh, that's wonderful. No, I, I, my German is fair, but I'll read it in English if it's in English. It's just faster for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sometimes I'll check the translation because you can, you can kind of tell when they've when they've fudged it. Yeah, or sort of made a decision about what something means. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the all of the theodrama of Balthazar is in English, isn't it? Yeah, his all of the major trilogy has been translated into English. Mm-hmm. Well, that so that's my other goal, Anne, is to read all of Karl Barth, Church Dogmatics, and all of the Theodrama of Balthazar. That's wonderful. And if I do that before I die, I will say I've lived a decent life. Peter, you want to join me? Uh, not in the German, but maybe in the English. <laughs> <laughs> and want to have a Balthazar reading party in German? <laughs> oh, I'm I'm always all for any Balthazar reading group. So maybe maybe you can. Uh, well, let's yeah, let's let's think about this in the future. Uh, if in any case, uh, we we want to have you on again in uh, in a few months uh, to talk about Mysterium Pascala, if you're willing. Oh sure, of course, uh, Balthazar. Um, Peter Peter got the book. I've only read about half of it so far, um, so I need to finish it, and then we could we can have a reading group on Mysterium Pascala. Mm, it'd be great. And uh, mm-hmm. I have I have the German as well, so we can work with that if you want. Fantastic. Um, and uh, but maybe in terms of Catholic systematic theology, uh, in our podcast uh, a, a little bit. Peter and and our dear listeners, over the years I've referred in passing to Karl Rahner, and um, who was a big influence on me when I was a young student just beginning my studies. Um, and I actually studied at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. Oh uh, yeah. And now, did, you. now all right, now I got to ask you this: Did you know Professor Marianne Donovan? I do not. Okay, she was my first systematics teacher, retired now, uh, sadly. Um, But I read Karl Rahner in that class along with the patristics. But, Anne, I wonder if you could maybe tell us maybe a couple of um, similarities between Rahner and Balthazar, but also how they might sharply diverge from each other. Yeah, there's, there's, um, for a while there... Catholic scholars had a kind of rivalry going between Rahner and Balthazar, but it, it never really served either theologian. Um, so, so lately, people have not been so much talking about the contrast between them as trying to work with them together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Karl, Rahner, Karl Rahner and Balthazar share training in Thomism, just like everyone in that generation did. They mm-hmm. shared a, a, a respect for Heidegger's thoughts. They both appropriated some Heideggerian ideas mm-hmm. into their theologies. Um, Rahner, I would say, is more, well, a kind of boilerplate take. Is, is Rahner is, is more systematic. He's doing a properly systematic theology. His book Foundation is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and his his other major concern is anthropological. So he really wants to make sense of theological anthropology, which I think he actually shares with Balthazar, but they come at it from from different angles. Um, 
Balthazar will begin a, a little bit more indirectly and Bronner will begin a little bit more almost biologically, uh, the sort of concrete phenomenon of bodies. Mm-hmm. And but, uh, um, well, how would you say that von Balthasar is not doing proper systematic theology? And what is he doing if he's not doing proper systematic theology? Well, he, like, he never, he never sits down and writes out a full theology of the Trinity. He assumes you've got training in the Christian tradition of that theology first. Because really what he's doing, instead of making certain uh, logical arguments for how a certain doctrine must be, which, which is one way to sort of do systematics. Mm. Instead, he's arranging all the pieces of doctrine and dogma and tradition and trying to show the nexus mysteriorum, the nexus of mysteries, how each mystery relates to the others, um, which is not not systematic, but he's not going to do it in a, in, in a way that I think most systematic theologians would recognize because he's, his major analogies all come from the world of art and music and the stage. Which I think is one of the reasons I personally find von Balthasar more relatable and readable than others, more traditional systematicians, is because I come from that world. And so it makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, he really loves the arts, and I think... I think if you love the arts for themselves, you can kind of recognize that in Balthazar and feel a kind of kinship. Mm-hmm. Well, there's certainly, just in what I've read in Mysterium Pascala, there's certainly a musical feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And the... But it's interesting that you say, quote-unquote, traditional systematics, because... I think, for instance, Karl Barth would say that he doesn't know what systematic theology is. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and that if you want a proper system, you need to go to Tillich. He says something equipped like that in the beginning of his dogmatics and outline. Yeah. Well, in, in Catholic land, you would want to go to Thomas Aquinas. He's going to be your main example of a theological system. Right. And so then, are you yourself a Thomist? I am. I'm kind of a a rogue Thomist since I'm <laughs> also a Balthazarian, uh, and those don't necessarily those types of people don't necessarily always get along. But yeah, I'm I'm broadly a Thomist, trained in Thomism. Uh, I've studied Bernard Lonergan too, who's also deeply Thomist. Uh, I haven't heard that name, um, but uh, my favorite of all these guys is Edward Skilabex. Yeah, he's another good. He's another good Thomist. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he's a good Thomist, but he's also a liberation theologian. Yeah, he he began his career in Thomism and sort of moves on. Uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> isn't isn't that what one is supposed to do? I'm sorry, that's my loser inside coming through. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. So why why did you choose uh, to both write your dissertation on Balthazar, but to really, as a systematician, uh, define and create yourself as a Balthazar scholar? What was your drive behind that? Um, so the first Balthazar that I met was the Balthazar of Theodrama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we read his soteriology in a, an undergrad class of mine. And I... It's a very weird soteriology because its major functional mechanism is the stage, the contrast of the stage, dialectic of the stage. And I 
got it. I loved it. I liked this weird way of doing theology that expected a lot from me. And so I kept I kept reading him and I've continued to explore his relationship to the arts and the way that transforms theology for him and transforms the arts because um, I also really love beauty. I'm very convinced by Balthazar's argument that we begin from there, the kind of primal phenomenon of the beautiful. Mm -hmm. Speaking of art, you have a book out, yes? I do. What is your book called? Theopoetics. Theopoetics. You're the author of Theopoetics. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I am. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's another book I have to get. Will you sign it for me? (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Thank you. I love it when people do that. (laughs) So we were at the Milwaukee Art Institute the other month, and I got to see in person the painting that's on the cover of Theopoetics. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful and, and powerful painting of a um, of a monk. St. Francis. Of St. Francis, in yes. Tomb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I picked that art because I wrote the book in Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, I wondered if there wasn't yeah. that connection there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just gorgeous by Francisco uh, Zerberon. Mm-hmm. So my, my one question when we talk about beauty, I, I, I don't disagree, particularly in, in thinking of the resurrection, but I'm also thinking of the relationship of the crucified Christ to the suffering of the world. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering how we would talk about beauty from that standpoint. Yeah, so... Near the beginning of Theodrama, Balthazar asks whether a drama of world history makes what he's established in Glory of the Lord, which is about the beautiful, whether that makes it impossible. Mm. Um, He talks about the cross as a kind of ungestalt, a a non-form, which is the the inversion or undoing of the beautiful form because of the suffering of the crucified one. And so Balthazar explicitly wonders whether his beauty can withstand things like suffering and evil, or is it just a kind of beauty that floats above above us all and is a utopian ideal we never reach? Mm. And uh, yeah, what? That makes me think of the of Picasso's crucifixion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's as it's a, it's as close as Balthazar gets to the grotesque. He doesn't really use the category of the grotesque. Mm-hmm. Um, but the crucifixion is as close as he gets to that. Yeah. Yes. P- P- well, no, not Picasso's crucifixion. Sorry, Dolly's crucifixion. My bad. Oh. But my world? my critique of Dolly's crucifixion is the the Christ in that picture is hanging above the world. It's from uh, it's from a sketch that John of the Cross did. Yeah. Yeah. That, then uh, then I wonder why John of the Cross. I mean, I don't know the. I I don't know his work. I I have a book on it back in the states, but. But I haven't, I haven't read it yet. I, I, but I'm very concerned when the Dali painting is taken as the image of the crucifixion because it's divorced from the world. And I think it was Johann Baptist Metz who said Christ was not crucified between two candles on uh, between two candles on an altar. Yeah, I think um, if you follow the sight lines of the original sketch. And Dali's painting, the way the light moves, is it actually pulls your eyes downward right, toward I'm the Sea of Galilee. Specifically okay. thinking of his, um, that's the Christ of St. John. I'm thinking of yeah. Corpus Hypercubus. Oh, that one. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm looking that one up so that's a good I one. can see That is a good it. one. 
I don't know if I know this Where painting. Jesus is sort of d- displaced. Yeah. On a, on a wild cross. Yeah. All right, let me see, because uh, the only thing that came up was something with a Pokemon ball. Oh, yeah, that <laughs> some, someone recreated it with Poland ball. Yeah, I mean, I, again, he's above the world. I'm, I'm very, very leery of that. Well, if you, so Dali's work is influenced, it's, it's surrealism is influenced by things like cubism, and so the distortions of Dali and Picasso, people like that, are actually trying to talk about how human being is stretched out over time. Uh, well, see, I love Picasso. Mm-hmm. Love Picasso. But the, the human being stretched out over time. Yeah, like I am, I am child me. I was child me. I am present me. Yeah. I have a future. And those are all me. Yeah, and and both Picasso's and Dali's crucifixions create that sense of the grotesque of of the crucifixion not being a pretty thing. Yeah, I don't. Well, okay, I don't see this as particularly horrible, but but I it's not. It's not. It's, gr- it's, it's not it's idealized. Grotesque. It's different, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I'm just looking at Picasso's crucifixion from 1930 in the yeah. moment. I'd never seen this before. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. That's a mess. Um, <laughs> well, it's supposed to be. I like the uh, the Brazilian, I think it's the Brazilian Worker's Cross, and it's a man. It's the Tortured Christ. That's what it's called, the painting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the name of the artist in a minute. Uh, not tortured for Christ. I want the tor- the torture of Christ. Good Lord. Ah, here it is. Okay, now what is this guy? If you Google uh, the tortured Christ, the terror of Easter, uh, and you see this this man, and it's a bone. You know, his ribs are sticking out, and he's he's all bones, and he's screaming in agony as he's nailed to the cross. That mm-hmm. to me, that that to me is more is more accurate. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's um, a very marked take. The Tortured Christ by Guido Ro- Roca, nineteen seventy five. Yeah, I came I came to that when I was reading um, Gustavo Gutierrez. True. Um, who, by the way, what what's Gutierrez's relationship to Thomism, in your opinion? Um, I actually don't know him well enough to know. Okay. So I will not say. (laughs) So so that's my, that's my next question. Do you work within the liberation tradition of Catholicism or not so much? I am, um, not really trained in liberation theology. I will read it with students because I think it's important for them to learn, Mm -hmm. but I'm not particularly a liberationist. I have recently started writing on um, decolonial ideas Mm -hmm. because those have to do with aesthetics and art. Uh Um, Yeah. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an enemy of liberation, but my training is quite different. Mm -hmm. Does that have something to do, do you think that you come from Marquette? Was the ethos of Marquette the more training in aesthetics? Which I think is fascinating, by the way. Um, certainly the Thomism, the the interest in different schools of tradition is a kind of Marquette thing. Uh, lately, they've done more liberation things. So it's it's slightly different now these days. But yeah, Marquette is a little more theole- theoretical, a little more historical in, in sort of point of view. And it, uh, uh, it, it would be different than from Loyola University, Chicago. Yes. Yeah, Which, although they have, I think they still have an annual grad conference together. Uh, Yes, but Loyola. I mean, I mean, just in the sense that Loyola does more of the liberationist turn. 
Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Um, but yeah, that's fascinating to me how all the different schools come. Um, and now, Dr. Maltman speaks in his autobiography that he and Hans Ernst von Balthasar had a commonality, and that was they were both radicalizing the theology of the cross. Do you find that in von Balthasar? I think it um, it depends on what you mean by radicalize. Uh, I think they, I think Balthasar is pushing the question not so much of Jesus's suffering but of what it embraces what reality the cross embraces and how it transfigures reality and in that sense he pushes as far as he thinks it, it can go but it's speculation he doesn't know if it's right he explicitly says i am speculating so it's new theology um, Moltmann always struck me as very arrested by the, the suffering of the cross in particular. Balthazar uh -huh. um, always worries that Moltmann has ontologized pain, has sort of made it a permanent feature of human existence. I don't know that that's fair to Moltmann. Um, hmm. I uh, I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, but I'm... I think he might say something like the very being of God has death at its center because of Golgotha. Yeah. And, and I, see, I struggle to understand what that means, I think. That in the crucifixion of Christ through a notion of what Luther called the happy exchange, Christ takes the entirety of sin, death, the devil, and hell onto himself on Golgotha. And that means, because Christ is God, the entire Trinity is in solidarity with those who suffer and knows the pain of suffering, and it's not a misery it loves company, it's a solidarity for the sake of liberation, shown in the fact that the crucified one of Golgotha is risen, but he's risen, and, and as the new future, right, the seedbed of new creation being the resurrection, mm -hmm. but he's risen with the wounds, as the Thomas story in John shows us. So... Yeah. So, cross and resurrection for Maltman and for Bart are two sides of the same coin. You can't speak of the cross without the resurrection, and you can't speak of the resurrection without the cross. Of course, you can speak of neither without the incarnation, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, th that's, that's kind of what Dr. Maltman is getting at. Or, you know, the, um, uh, the heart of God beats with love for the entirety of creation— as seen on Golgotha. You know, that, that kind of thing is, is true in line with what Maltman would say. But I don't okay. think that he would say pain is a permanent part. I think he would say pain is a part of human existence because we see it in catastrophes all around us. Uh, but, but the hope is that Jesus is the world's future and creation's future and, of course, humankind's future um, because he is risen. Does so, God learn something about suffering on the cross? Um, I don't know that, that he would go that far to the sort of okay. process Whiteheadian thing because he would talk about the suffering Shekinah in the wilderness which he um, draws from Abraham Heschel for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I, I don't think it's that God quote unquote changes uh, the uniqueness of it though is that God has become human 
and 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 that's the that the one difference between the Shekinah uh, and Golgotha is you have a human embodied God in a way that you don't have uh, in the in the presence in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I would say that's that's incarnation again, not necessarily a the bad God of the Old Testament, the good God of the New Testament. You know, he's not a Marcionite. Um, right. <clears throat> I don't think Karl yeah. Barth was either, even though Lutherans like to accuse him of being one. I, I don't. I, I don't think that's fair. Um, and and I I think you're asking me these questions because you're trying to see if 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 there's a Hegelianizing going on here, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what uh, what what have I what have I revealed to you in what I'm saying? Uh, I think. Yeah, I, I'm impressed by how hard Moltmann seems to be trying to stay on the side of the impassable God. Um, oh, he wouldn't say God is impassable. He would say a God who cannot suffer is not God, but a monster. Well, I think a God who suffers is a monster, though. Why? Why? Because he's not God. Hmm. If God can change, that means that I can judge that change according to some higher measure. And whatever that is, that's God. Not the suffering thing in front of me. Which is a very, very Thomas take. Yeah, yeah, Maltman, Maltman very much believes in a passable God. Very much. He, I don't think... But he's I, I don't not think... process in ways that I was surprised in your description anyways. Yeah, in 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 my description, I'm not doing my dissertation on him. He's my doctor father, but I'm not, you know, I'm not writing on him per se, but I have written on uh his theology uh, in the past for my MTH thesis and then I did a a, a round of uh, one of my doctoral exams on his thought when I was still in the states. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's process theology. Now, he's very good friends with Catherine Keller, and they mm-hmm. respect one another's work. But I think, I think Maltman has um, alliances with process theology because for him, God is passable. God has to be passable, otherwise... Otherwise, it's not God. That's the difference for him between the God of the Bible and the God of the philosophers, the God of the Greek philosophers in particular, Plato and Aristotle. Yeah, uh, I think that's a kind of Harnackian lie that there's this Hellenism over here, Judaism over there. Uh, mix well, them I, up, and then you lose them. I, I could be, I'm not sure Maltman would want to be thought of as in the uh, stream of Adolf von Harnack, but I'm not sure. Um, I think he'd much rather be thought of as in line with Gerhard von Rad, who was his Old Testament professor, oh, okay. uh, and Otto Weber, who was his doctor father. And, uh, and to some degree, well, really, Maltman doesn't want to be in line with anybody. Maltman <laughs> wants to be himself. He's very clear on that. But, but he respect that. He he would call himself, he has called himself to me before, directly, a left-wing Bartian. Okay. Um, and, and he has, <laughs> he has called himself a Hegelian, <laughs> a left-wing <laughs> Hegelian. Uh, but, but those, those two were the only thing, and reformed. Uh, but, uh, but he doesn't want to be, you know, narrowly confined. He draws a little bit from everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the things that I really respect about him. Um, it's also one of the things that drives some systematic theologians crazy because number one, he, dr- he draws from basically everybody. And number two, uh, he doesn't really care about theological method that much. And, uh, that drives some people crazy. Uh, he's more fascinated by the content of theology, mm. if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and, uh, uh, so so yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not sure about the going back to Harnack, and chiefly the reason I say that is because I know he does not 
like the work of Paul Tillich that much. And okay. obviously there's a line with Harnack and Tillich. Um, I, I very much like Tillich myself. I, I, I am still somewhat of a Tillichian, much as people have tried to beat it out of me. It's just, you know, it's, it's like a bad habit. It just doesn't leave you, I'm afraid. I never beat you. I only threw pens at you. You only threw pens at me. Yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, would you, Anne, would you call von Balthazar a Bartian? Um, he's a Catholic Bardian. I think he might even call himself that. Uh-huh. Hmm. Yeah, but that sort of means, that means he reads Bart differently than, say, Bruce McCormick does. Right. Very, right. very differently. And yeah. he'll push back against Bart, too. So Bart, for him, is a great example of a theologian who takes seriously the glory of God. That doesn't, of course, make him perfect. Uh, Balthazar <laughs> yeah. think, the thinks only perfect- you need analogy. You need analogy for Balthazar. Yeah. The, the only it. perfect theologian is Thomas Aquinas, right? Uh, not for Balthazar. Uh, there's no one's Jesus. There's, there's just Jesus who's Jesus. Now, Balthazar was rather conservative socially, right? No, not really. He's taken to be that way in a lot of American Catholic discussions. But he, like, he's conservative in a Swiss Catholic way, which puts him on the left of what most Americans would think. Right, it's like like when evangelicals try to claim ownership of Bonhoeffer they're kind of missing the point but I thought von Balthasar argued for instance against the ordination of women he does yeah he's quite conservative about tradition but he also condemns colonialism the conquistadors Um, he reads the anarchist socialist Charles Peggy and approves of Peggy's writing. So Balthazar doesn't really have a spot that's gonna always place him. He he doesn't play well on teams, as one of my friends always puts it. Yeah. Try to get him on your team and he'll be different. We've got so about. that's definitely something to to respect about him. I mean, there are, obviously he's a he's a giant of Catholic theology, but um, that especially that you're saying he doesn't want to be put on a team that that really makes me even more excited for when I can start. Well, number one, when I can finish Mysterium Pascala and have an intelligent discussion with the two of you about it. That's the first thing. But the second thing is is after the doctorate uh, when I can think about starting to read the Theodrama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many volumes are the Theodrama? Five, like a five-act play. Yeah, they have the whole thing in German. They've got it at the uh, Antiquariat Bader, one of the one, one of my favorite bookshops here in Tubing, and and I mm. really want to buy it, but it's like seventy euros, and I just yeah, uh, yeah. But yep. yes, I I really want to get a hold of it. Um. We've just got a little bit of time left, and I wanted to get into some of the stuff that's going on in a more current state because, um, and you're you're a professor, and um, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that your school has gone to your the university you're at has gone to distance learning at this point in time. Oh, that was yeah, actually we've, supposed we've to be our digital. discussion today. Sorry, I hijacked it. It's okay. <laughs> You brought a systematician on our podcast and expected me not to hijack it, Peter. I didn't expect you not to hijack it, but I'm hijacking it back now. Okay. <laughs> so how's that yeah, been going? Yeah, we've gone digital. Yeah. How's that going? What are the some of the challenges uh, uh, that, that you and and maybe even some joys that you've been experiencing with that? Um, we were just talking about this as a department. Um, We've all had to adjust our pedagogy. Mm -hmm. None of us 
none of us really none of us really enjoy staring at our computers and considering that teaching mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah but but it's it's for the common good right now and so everyone recognizes that so we've been doing a lot of zoom uh, one of my colleagues has been recording his lectures uh, John heaps is doing that too um, so like flipping the classroom it's called where you do you record lecture and then you use zoom time for class discussion mm-hmm. uh, people have been doing quizzes and exams online that kind of thing so we're really giving this digital stuff uh, a workout and students appreciate that we're still having class but i think they they vary in terms of how they think of it mm. people who come to st mary's come because they like the small classroom size and they like talking to their professors right so taking that away from a small college takes away a lot of the reason people are around. Mm-hmm. Is this St. Mary's in Moraga? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the administrative assistant to the president is, I believe, Pastor Sana Reinholdson. I don't know. <laughs> or used to be. Okay. It was she and I knew one another from Berkeley. But anyway, I love your campus. It's beautiful. I, I've been to the yeah. church there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. are, you, are, are you in your office now? I am, yeah. Okay. I, I live on campus as an RD, so I still have my office. So you're a professor of systematic theology and you're a residential director? Yes, I am. <laughs> I live in California. It's hard to live here financially. Yeah. 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 Uh, I did my MDiv at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, by the way. Okay, so yeah, you would have an idea. Yeah. Oh, do I ever. I'm still paying off my living expenses from California. <laughs> <laughs> have you been involved in any of the conversations about how and, and when the decisions have been made to send students home or when they might be able to come back? No, I wasn't part of any of those decisions. I tended to find out five minutes before they did. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. Which has been the case at most institutions. Right. Um, So everyone's making decisions on the fly, and we've never done any of this before. Right. It's it's just new ground for everyone. And it's it's interesting for me, the sort of philosophy of distance learning. I have uh, my son is in elementary school, and we're doing distance learning there. And there's had to be some adjustment Mm -hmm. of expectations because of things that you can't do in person. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm wondering sort of how much are you expecting your students to put in their normal amount of like class time plus homework time or, or are you going a little easy on them or? Oh, well, I haven't adjusted our assignments because they have a weekly assignment that they do. Mm Mm-hmm. But if we get through if we get through a lecture early, I won't keep them around extra just to chat at them. <laughs> so, okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, at least that's my philosophy. I don't like to fill up air. Um, so it's been I I share my screen a lot with them so they can see what I'm looking at and typing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which makes us a super efficient class. So they, because we all end up with the same notes by the end of the lecture. And I think that's been effective learning wise, but it's also kind of sprinty in terms of pace. Yeah. Now I know you've taught some really interesting courses. Like I think you've done a theology and Star Wars course at some point. Is that correct? Yeah, I did a, a, we have a January term Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I taught Star Wars and theology. Yeah. 
Do you have anything like that going on Thomas right now? Thomas is on Star Wars. Um, well, right now I'm teaching a course called uh, the, the Vatican Nazis and the Common Good. Mm. Wow. And it's basically, yeah, it's basically about French Catholicism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's struggle with authoritarianism and against authoritarianism. Mm-hmm. And that's been a lot of fun. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you kind of get, there are, there are two factions in French Catholicism. You've got a kind of authoritarian royalist faction that for the most part ends up supporting the Vichy regime, the Nazis. Right. You've you've got this whole other group of French Catholics who join the resistance. Mm-hmm. Well, they struggle so with I the think, same things that the Lutheran Church struggles with at the same time, and you end yeah. up with a divide there as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a really it's a nice little microcosm of Christians deep like trying to deal with their relationship to power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what does von Balthasar's theology have to say about that? When one has power, one should have a spirit of renunciation, he says. Mm. Gosh, he just knows how to say everything eloquently. <laughs> like, he could, he could look at me and say, you are damned to hell, and I would be like, Professor Balthazar, or rather, uh, Doctor Father Balthazar, uh, that's so elegant. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So, are are students managing to stay engaged with the online courses and things like that? Are you feeling like they're, you know, the or are you, or is it a little harder to keep them engaged with the online stuff? Um, my. Vatican course, I think they're staying fairly engaged. I have a seminar course, which is almost entirely discussion, and that's been much more of a challenge. Mm, mm-hmm. I can see that. I can. I took a seminar course in seminary, and I could see how that would have been very difficult to do by distance. Yes, yes. Plus, they figured out that on Zoom, you can give yourself a different background. That oh, was a gosh. disaster. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's just no good. That's. <laughs> I told them they're allowed one per session. <laughs> <laughs> and are most of your students, because you're at St. Mary's, are most of your students Roman Catholic? Uh, about half are something like Roman Catholic, but the other half is from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, including non Christians. Nuns, as they call themselves, and oh, yes, well, as we call them, I guess. And do do students have a kind of spiritual formation requirement with the college, or have I just spent too much time in the seminaries? No, they they have to take two classes with us: the theology and religious studies. Yeah, which but is they not don't, quite spiritual formation, but they're they're not required to go to chapel or something. Oh no. Mm-mm. Yeah, fewer and fewer places are doing that. I know even I went to a fairly conservative Christian school, and even they didn't require chapel by the time I got there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends on the institution's culture. Yeah. Well, certainly there's no... There's there's nothing like that in tubing, and people would laugh at you. Um, you know, if you start. To, I mean, you can, of course, but but mm-hmm. nobody's. I, I live in the, and you may have heard of it in the Evangelische Stift in tubing, and um, yeah, okay. So I, I I can't hate Hegel because I live in the house where Hegel lived, yeah. uh, but uh, Hegel and Schelling and Hölderlin, which I never can say that name. They all they all lived here. Uh, as did Johannes Kepler. But anyway, um, so we have we have services and things in the Stift, but that is um, 
that is separate certainly from the university and separate from the theology faculty. It's not that if you're a part of the evangelical theology faculty that you uh, you live in the Stift. No, uh, it's, you know, the, and the Catholics, from what I understand, the the Catholic faculty is, is the same way. They have their Stift, the mm-hmm. Willem Stift. Uh, and I guess all the 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 spiritual religious formation stuff is there, uh, but it isn't um, the sort of requirement either. Um, yeah, I think I think so. And uh, uh, the uh, the Albrecht Bengel House, which are the uh, Protestant Pietists, or at least they were historically, they I think have requirements for that kind of formation. Um, but would probably be the only people with tu- with in tubing and who do. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean even even universities historically deeply connected to the academic study of theology. Well, Marquette didn't have requirements like that either, did they? Nope. Yeah. It's all changing, and I'm not sure for the better, by the way. Hmm. Yeah, Baltazar. One of the more famous things Balthazar said is he wanted the return of a kneeling theology, he calls it, the reunion of spirituality and theology. Mm-hmm. Oh, amen. That's a that's a mm-hmm. nice uplifting note. I think we should wrap it up on that. Yes, okay. I do too. Thank you so much for joining us. Please come back and see us in a little while to talk about Mysterium Pascala by uh, von Balthasar. Uh, I'd love that. I and love that. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stay and, safe out uh, there in the Bay Area. Thank yeah, you. Definitely. Pray for us, please. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And... Uh, Until a few days from now, when Peter and I reconvene, I'm Brock Jennings. And I'm Peter Clark. And this is Stumbling Block. Stumbling Block is a production of Silver Turkey Studios. Our Patreon producer is Ben Dittman. Our executive producer is Peter Clark. And our executive director is Brock Jennings. Our theme music is by Mirrors for Windows, and we are hosted by Podbean. We can be reached by email at stumblingblockpodcast at gmail.com. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash stumblingblock. And as always, thank you for listening.